Hi everyone, uh, this is Juan and uh, I'm welcoming you to the, our innovation series at the Dubai Fintech Summit 2024 by Emirates NBD. So I'm excited to welcome four distinguished guests. Uh, we have uh, Raul Kumar from Liv. Raul, do you want to give a bit of an introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, delighted to be here and take part in Emirates MBD's innovation series. Uh, so I joined Liv, which is Emirates, M Emirates MBD's digital bank, um, 15 months ago. So I work in the wealth and trading department and I head up strategy for them. So, uh, yeah. Oh, welcome to have you on board, Raul. Thanks a lot for joining. Uh, Serena, what about you? Thank you, Emirates MBD. Uh, first of all, to hosting us today at this podcast. Uh, I'm Serena Sebastiani. I lead um, a digital asset uh, consulting business for PwC in the Middle East. Uh, I've been in the fintech space and uh, uh, previously wealth management, asset management space for the last 15 years. Uh, uh, excited to have this conversation with you guys today. Thanks for being he here, Serena. And what about you, Matt? Thanks. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm Matt. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Control Alt. Uh, we tokenize assets. Um, so we are part of the, the generation of infrastructure players that are looking to bring alternative assets um, to a much wider audience. Nice, nice. Thanks a lot, guys, for uh, being here with us today. So uh, we'll discuss three topics today. Um, and the first of them is uh, how the investor landscape is changing. So there's a few studies around uh, how much uh, how much money um, older investors are passing down to to younger generations, namely Gen Z, etc. Uh, there's a study about that in uh, America around 84 um, 84 trillion in assets going to be passed down to younger generations in the next 10 years. How do you guys think that, and maybe I'll give it first to you, Roll, how do you guys think that will uh, impact wealth management and basically like banking offers around like uh, wealth? So I think, you know, to, to also set the scene as well. Um, so obviously given my background, sort of retail, retail investment, retail wealth and trading side, um, you're seeing a huge rise now in investing. So investing is now seen to be the cool thing. You know, you're, you're 18 to 25, you want to own, you know, a piece of Apple, a piece of Tesla, et cetera. Um, so what we've done is we've now basically got an environment where you've got younger Gen Z investors um, who are more akin to the investment game, you know, be it US equities or crypto. But then what this great hand-me-down is going to do is that it's going to open up a wider pool of cash. So now when these Gen Zers that hit 30, 40, they're going to be inheriting large chunks of cash. Now, traditional private banking, wealth management has normally been, you know, old school, face-to-face, -face, I'm on the call, give me an update on my portfolio type thing. I think so what you're now going to see is with this great hand-me-down that people, Gen Zers, want stuff on their mobile. So, you know, you've got the legacy banks, Emirates MBD, for example, we've got an amazing EMBDX app, whereas 10 years ago, no one would have thought that. Everyone wants to do their banking, you know, in branch, et cetera. So I think where you'll see the shift is, is that you will then have private banking solutions actually available, fully digital. So, you know, I, there's some global startups in the UK. There's one called Vega, um, who are basically trying to take a private bank, but make it fully digital. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I think that that's definitely an area um, which will evolve given, given this great hand-me-down. And I think also, you know, access to other asset classes as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, following out from that, like, what do you think, Matt, that like, you know, how can fintechs and innovation really like bridge that gap and, uh, you know, really delve into the future with regards to how these products are offering like to younger generations? Yeah, I mean, it's coming back to your point, right? It's one, how do you interact? How do these, this generation want to interact with their investments? And then there's a second point as to what do they actually want to, to invest in? And, you know, I wouldn't even say that's just exclusive to, to Gen Z. You've got the millennial generation, which also feel the same um, kind of sentiment around what they want to invest in. And it's no longer, you know, just stocks or, or bonds. People are looking for what's, what's beyond those asset classes. Um, you know, they've seen things that have been very restrictive to them before. You know, they've seen much wealthier customers get wealthier with these asset classes. 
you look at real estate in, in the UK, for example, it's very difficult for young people, Gen Zers, to get onto the real estate market and get exposure to that asset class. So, you know, if you, you know, as a financial institution are then able, or as a wealth manager, able to give people access to something that, you know, has been close to their heart, they haven't been able to do so before, um, and potentially get that upside as well. That's really, that's really exciting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Serena, what do you think? So, I mean, you've, you're, you are at PwC, so I guess you're covering like a lot of uh, countries here in the Middle East. So how do you see that adoption really, you know, changing across like countries with different demographics? So probably if we're thinking about the country where the population is maybe younger, maybe one would think that maybe the adoption of these like type of offerings is probably uh, growing faster. Absolutely. If we take, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia, where we have a uh, uh, way uh, younger population, very tax savvy, hundred five percent of mobile phone penetration, right? So it's it's it is really like a, a population that looks for digital products, for UX, for mobile first uh, um, adoption of uh, of what product having product is definitely growing uh, growing faster. It's also due to the government initiatives uh, pushing to higher savings uh, and um, uh, very similar initiatives, by the way, uh, in the UAE, in Oman, uh, um, I would say actually across the GCC in general, right? Obviously, then Saudi is a wider population, is th- 34 million people. Yeah, we have we 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 can drive adoption there. Um, well, it, again, uh, it's it's really like into new products, uh, new asset classes, the uh, access uh, to uh, technology, to innovation, um, and UX uh, um, user experience first, uh, automation, uh, and something that can really help like educating people yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. I think to your point as well, what's interesting is, is that, you know, yes, there's globally, there's, you know, countries with different levels of wealth. So, you know, if you look at Africa, for example, Africa, there's a bunch of innovative startups out of there who yeah. are using, you know, tokenization or even actually investing in US equities, for example, to bypass currency control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think having this Gen Z who are going to get a hand-me-down as well down the line those guys are now seeing, okay, hang on a minute. And they're very young populations, right? So we're, they're, they're fully aware of these types of product offerings out there, you know, through social media, everything's accessible, everyone's privy to it. So they're going, hang on a minute, like I, I need a piece of the pie. Um, so you're getting a lot more startups now offering those traditional services. So I think, and given that they've got the capital as well, because they're starting to inherit as well, yeah. um, you're going to see the rise as well. Yeah. So yes, I think they're slightly behind us. In terms of, you know, I'd say the UK, Europe, US, um, and, you know, parts of the Middle yeah. East, right? Specifically UAE. Um, but they're definitely, they're definitely catching up. Yeah. The Egypt's a good, good example. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's a good point then to bring um, the, the, um, the topic of tokenization and how tokenization is being delved into the general wealth offering. We can call it like that, and maybe Matt, you can help us like understand a bit more around how tec- tokenization can help us within our wealth offerings here at the Emirates NBD and Live. Uh, but also, you know, it explain a bit more how it works and also what Control Alt does in terms of of tokenization. Tokenization is a bit of a buzzword. People yeah. people, people use it quite frequently, and, and they use it to mean different things. But at, at a very base level, as as we know, it's the representation of of yeah. some kind of asset. Um, through the blockchain and, and through tokens, right? Yeah. But what, what what does that actually mean for for an end customer? What does that actually enable them to do? <laughs> what what the blockchain is 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 just a ledger. It's a record of ownership, right? So if you're able to then record ownership of assets on this distributed ledger, on this technologically advanced ledger, you're able to get a lot of the operational efficiencies that have made it really difficult for you know providers, financial institutions to give access to alternative investments yeah. in the first place. So this technology should really be seen as an, an efficiency tool. It's really driving... An enabler. Exactly. It's the enabler for people to invest in alternatives. But what you're doing is you're taking this traditionally very clunky kind of investment and digitalizing it, right? So I worked at, you know, biggest banks in, in, in the world with alternative assets and their infrastructure was just 
awful, yeah. right? It's just really, really old and, and clunky, right? And what we have here is an opportunity to completely revolutionize that. And that's exactly what we're exploring with you guys, right? And that's what's so exciting to see, you know, big financial institutions now looking at adopting this technology, implementing that for their customers. And then as a result, their customers get a much better experience, one that's consistent with the digital experience that we expect new generations to want to have, but also one that will then give them access to the assets that have typically been yeah. cordoned off from them. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And um, Rol, maybe you can help us to understand like how um, companies like Emirates NBD and Live can use these kind of assets to basically um, enable offerings for their customers and uh, how do you think that basically your customers would uh, would be interested about that? Absolutely. I, I think just also to, to round off Matt, Matt's earlier sort of uh, explanation around tokenization. So, you know, at Emirates MBD, we're the customer is number one of our focus. Um, and I guess, you know, absolutely with the implementation of tokenization, you are really driving that operational efficiency. And this ties in then to what we can offer to our customers, right? So a pain point sitting here in the UAE is that the US markets trade during a uh, during yeah. time that most people are sleeping. So if you have tokenized securities, for example, you have access to market 24 seven and instant settlement. So I'm not then worried about, you know, say I decide to sell a couple of Apple stocks, um, then I'm waiting two days for the money to actually hit my account and then be able to trade. So that is actually like, that's pie, that's real value to the customer. But it goes beyond customer. It, it, it also enables operational efficiency. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so I think look, that that's from the operational side. So that's, you know, existing product suite. Um, it also allows customers to access to different asset classes. Um, so, you know, Matt, you touched upon, you know, specifically in the UK, pretty hard to jump on the property ladder before you're 40 if you haven't got help from bank of mum and dad, right? Yeah. Um, so this tokenized real estate allows you the option to, you know, dip into a property market, buy a fraction of a piece of real estate, build that passive income, potential investment opportunity. It also offers customers the ability to diversify yeah. your real estate portfolio. So, you know, Joao, for example, you're from Portugal, yeah. right? But you live in Dubai. So exactly. you probably want to split your real estate portfolio between UAE and Portugal. So you want to manage it in an easier way, right? For example, through your mobile app. Would exactly. So, so, you know, you've, you've got that. And then you've also got more complex products as well, which traditionally have higher barriers to entries, um, you know, for retail investors. So for example, bonds, minimum token size is yeah. only, you know, $100,000, right? My, my main retail investor at live between the age of 18 to 30 doesn't have a hundred thousand dollars sitting in their account. Exactly. Um, so really driving down that minimum investment is, you know, brilliant. And I think that pans really well with my next question, which is, uh, for Serena, which is basically how can basically financial institutions when they're offering these services really educate their customers around the risks that they incur, but also the potential opportunities that they should probably uh, take advantage of when trying to invest in tokenized assets, being them traditional assets like bonds that Raul just mentioned or real estate. Different tools. Uh, I think uh, I, in this case, yes, it's the role of the financially of financial institutions to educate the customers. It's also um, a matter of collaboration, right, uh, with uh, with fintech, uh, with uh, a, by using. Uh, um, using media channels, uh, we are looking at uh, a younger population now. We need to use their language. Uh, I mean, if uh, if um, if we are gonna offer them a book or an entire uh, encyclopedia to to read, maybe we are not really targeting uh, you know uh, the right uh, the right customers that we actually have. We need we gotta use TikTok. We gotta use uh, Instagram. We gotta use uh, their language and their channels. Uh, so modernizing uh, the finan financial institutions oh, uh, and how we operate and how we communicate uh, is also important. Uh, and I think, yeah. I mean, this podcast is actually a great, uh, great way to start doing so. Exactly, exactly. But on, um, it's actually you said something important, right? Because uh, also on younger generation and what uh, um, the, 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 the accessibility is and uh, what the access uh, we have and we don't have... And, most likely your client don't have like hundred uh, um thousand dollars to invest and there are so many great initiatives that also very big players are putting in place 
and we see BlackRock tokenizing funds um, with, I mean, uh, the build uh, that has uh, five million, uh, uh, five million minimum investments uh, token uh, sold a one dollar value. So this is giving access, uh, and um, through giving access, uh, you actually also enhance uh, education. Yeah, because people experiment and have the possibility to enter a space that they wouldn't enter otherwise. Franklin Templeton and just announced even in Dubai. Uh, the partnership with Medad issuing the stable, uh, the stable yield, the first actually the yield stable, uh, so a stable kind that actually guarantees uh, um, yield uh, to 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 the token holders uh, as well. We'll have an entry ticket that is pretty, yeah. you know, accessible. So giving this accessibility while uh, through blockchain and the ledger protecting uh, um, protecting ownership. And that's also a regulator's responsibility yeah. to support us and financial institution in actually setting the landscape involves has... yeah and setting the ground and the name yeah. and with the regulatory infrastructure. The way I see it is, is sort of almost you know you had fractional equities that was around sort of you know mid mid tens right twenty fifteen fifty is when it first started kicking Robin, off Robin Hood Robin. exactly right <laughs> and then we we came along and tried to do the same thing at Revolut um so look so I think that really then created this trade craze around trading and as you've seen then it's had an impact on financial market right yeah. market has gone up more people have invested definitely much more retail participants right. so I think what you're going to see is with tokenization you're going to see the opening up of these asset classes to retail investors. Yeah. You're going to have more volumes pumping in as retail investors look to, you know, f diversify their their investments, given there's a more acute market awareness. And you know, it's yeah. uh, that that's actually going to be the impact. Yeah. And um, and Matt, what do you think? Like, I mean, we already we already spoke about uh, high yield bonds, etc., and uh, other financial asset classes. What do you think are you know the really cool stuff that's being done out there in terms of uh, asset tokenization? And really, things that you know are out of the box that haven't been widely seen yet. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a bit of a nerd, so I I, I quite like um, even just private credit, which is such a, an interactive market right now. It's not necessarily the most um, you know headline grabbing, but being able to tokenize private credit, which is such a, an attractive asset class when interest rates are high for sophisticated investors, is incredible. For retail investors, um, I think what what I'm really excited about are, are assets like film. Mm. Um, or uh, music rights yeah. and I think allowing you know fans of content of, and of media to participate in the upside of that so you know I'm a fan I'm going to watch films I'm going to the concerts I'm streaming the music I then get to see the upside because I'm also invested in that artist is a real way for you know not only artists to connect with with their communities but also a way for, for fans to yeah. To benefit so i think that's a really interesting way so and i guess it's actually like things that people are really connected with and and they know about i mean you know the average joe probably doesn't know you know what's the the pnl of a random sp500 company yes but you know they will they will know how much star wars did in their first yeah. uh, week of the blockbuster yeah, absolutely. Right? absolutely you know we're talking about education and and a lot of people are already quite in the know when it comes to um you know you know, films or when it comes to um to real estate you know people are trusted to buy their own homes so why are they not trusted then to invest in in real estate so um yeah from an education perspective assets that are already well known to that audience you know the barrier to entry from an education perspective is a lot is a lot lower i think to matt's point it definitely helps when it's related right? yeah and, you know so you're seeing videos on instagram tiktok of should i buy an etf or should i buy a chanel and say, you know, Chanel bag's gone up, well, 900 <laughs> and <laughs> Do not, uh, of course, it's a very good investment. <laughs> yeah. No comment. I'm At gonna... least it's tangible. Yeah. <laughs> More than an ETF. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, it's to Matt's point, it's uh, it's definitely helps with, with being relatable. Yeah. Matt, Matt touched on uh, on something uh, on something else that is also important, private credits, right? Private credit for SME. How relevant it is in this region yeah. where we have a serious issue of SME financing, and uh, and this is also an opportunity for financial institutions, by the way, 
powered up, additionally powered up by uh, open banking and open finance and, and uh, easier, easier access to great information and uh, but through tokenization. So private credit uh, tokenization market is currently worth uh, $1 trillion globally and only set to grow. And this is the region uh, that can lead the path together with Africa. Absolutely. And, and we're working on some big deals with this in, in, in the UK at the moment. This is such an interesting space. And it's really important to consider that when you look at tokenization, there are two sides. There's the demand side and then there's the supply side. So we touched on the demand side with being able to give people access to, to these kinds of investments through tokenization. But what that does on the other side is it gives greater pools of capital. So that benefits you know, everyone that, that is an asset owner, um, existing financial institutions, or you know, people that want to get content created. Like That is really powerful on the other side as well. So it's important to consider both of them together. Yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe to finalize and just to go back to our initial topic around the Gen Zers, what do you guys think that your specific uh, companies and the institutions that you work for can do to enable this market for Gen Zers and uh, enable the next uh, generation of, of investing? Just uh, 30 seconds to close it out. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say that from my side. I think we need to work with existing players in, in the space that already have the, the, the kind of reputation. Um, you think partnerships with them are going to be really important to help bring that technology, bring these assets to them to interact with them. Going somewhere where they're already familiar makes it easier for us to get new assets, new products in front of them. So I think for, for a business like ours, it's really important to keep that conversation with, with the existing players, partner with them and work very closely with them. Paul, what about you, Rural? So I think that it, it comes down to customer experience, uh, number one. So it's basically providing, providing customers with actual assets that there's real interest for. It's about educating the customer and keeping it simple as well. Yeah, you know, being able to being able to invest through four or five clicks—that's what we're going for. Not you know going through reams and reams of screens, dropping yeah. off, etc. Um, and I think look to, to echo Matt's point. Obviously, we, we signed uh, an MOU today with, with Control Alt, and it and it's really actually to use these fintechs who have the expertise in house and to partner with them. You know, for for a bank like us, in order to set it up set up that machine takes a couple of years at the very least yeah. right so you know our customers want it now but they also want it with a trusted financial name such as emirates mbd you know which live offers right um so it's really also that speed to market by by working with fintechs as yourselves yeah cool and serena how can uh, pwc support all this ecosystem uh, for us uh, is a commitment uh, to uh support uh ecosystem build out uh by basically working together with regulators, uh, governments, uh, so really establishing this policy and long-term strategies uh, uh, that, uh, that will, uh, will enable, uh, will be enabler and will set up the right infrastructure. Work with financial institutions uh, for them to bring to market new value propositions, new products, new services. This means higher access, uh, cheaper products, uh, and, uh, and uh, higher and more convenient journey. Obviously, all this is coupled with uh, our um, ecosystem build-out and community build-out efforts, uh, so partnership with FinTech and you see in the space that are interesting and cool ideas. Cool. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot for uh, for joining me for the podcast today. Uh, and thanks to our listeners for, uh, for staying switched on to our uh, ENBD podcast series. Thanks a lot. Stay uh, tuned for the next one. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.